Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where Dr. Janine Krause, that's me, gives you, a health junkie, a weekly dose of tools to help you increase your energy and resilience to life stressors. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. On today's podcast, I'm interviewing Kristen Bowen. She is the owner and founder of Living the Good Life Naturally. It's a website dedicated to helping folks improve their life naturally. But most importantly, we're talking about her magnesium, how she sources it, why it's important to pay attention to getting natural versus synthetic magnesium and how she went from an autoimmune condition bedridden depressed with daily seizures to an entrepreneur helping folks out just like her so today we've got a story but we also are going to be talking about a lot of things about magnesium and I learn quite a bit in this podcast so I guarantee that you will too so let's jump into the interview Hello there, health junkies. I have Kristen Bowen on, and we are going to be talking about living the good life naturally, which of course is her website, but also all of the things that happen when you turn from, I call it the dark side, to heading toward <laughs> the natural side. So Kristen, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Oh, thank you. Glad to be on the other side of the dark side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a uh, it's funny, you know, when you when you take the little steps one by one to change over from all the chemical laden products to ones that are non toxic, and you know where they're sourced from and things of that nature, all of a sudden things start to improve and you start to get energy back and you start to feel better. And of course, because you have your own line and, and we'll talk about those here in a little bit, you know, all about those things. So because of that, you have a story. And the autoimmune side of things is something I see a lot in my office and in particular folks who are bedridden, depressed, not wanting to move, you know, it hurts to move and, and it just feels yeah. like a whole thing just to get out of bed. So I would love to, you to just give us a little backstory because I think it's so important for folks to hear the backstory to why you created the living, the, the good life naturally products and, and how you got to where you are today, because I think maybe if we can just give a little glimmer of, Hey, if you can just slowly eliminate some of these toxic items, you might be able to get 1% better every single day. So yeah. tell us a little bit about your background, what was going on? How, how did things unfold for you? So I'd been diagnosed with an autoimmune celiac and had experienced um, arthritis, wasn't officially diagnosed at that point, but the diagnosis came a little bit later and had just had my fourth baby and wanted to be able to get back into exercise, which is a critical component for me with that depression that's been wired into my journey. And so I wasn't able to run. I started running and I, every time I ran, took a step, laughed, my bladder would leak. And I was like, what the heck? I've never experienced this. And so I reached out to my OBGYN who had delivered my baby and the, it was like, oh, come in, we'll check. Sounds like your bladder's fallen, which it had. Oh. And that was the beginning of the end <laughs> the beginning of the new me, the beginning, it, it just was that meridian of time for me. I went in and he, we did a bladder tie up and went in not realizing I had Melissa syndrome, which is there's a small percentage of people who cannot tolerate and they have an allergic reaction to titanium. Mm -hmm. And they use titanium screws to hang the cadaver graft. And my body shut down on the table and they coded me several times. I ended up in a wheelchair having seizures, lost most of my hair for three and a half years. We went from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to put those pieces together in putting me back together. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I think it's very, you know, common for folks to have sensitivities to different implements that we put in the body to varying degrees. 
And a lot of docs are now more aware of it. Some, like some folks are even testing. I know a lot of the dental procedures now they'll test for, do you have a sensitivity to these mm-hmm. particular metals and things of that nature? But I think it's really, really key, especially with the bladder stuff to hear how this kind of unfolds and especially with prolapse, oh, on top of other things. Well, Uh, and then on top of that, the cadaver graft that was used was bought off market and it had mold on it. So you took the combination of the mold, a previous autoimmune, the reaction to the titanium, and it was just a recipe for disaster. But at the time, Western medicine didn't look at titanium as causing the issue. And so there was very few solutions out there for us. It finally took a physician's assistant who was just willing to listen to some out of the box symptoms and do some research. And he was the one that actually put that puzzle piece together for us. Wow. Wow. Thank goodness for him to sleuth things out. I mean, that's, that's why I do this podcast just to give folks little glimmers of like, Hey, could this be what's going on? Hey, could this be it? And then finding someone who can advocate for you. How long did it take from meeting with the physician's assistant to getting the titanium out of you and all of that? So the first meeting was him just listening. And he looked at us and said, I have absolutely no idea what is going on with you. I am willing to research though. And at that point, we knew we had a keeper because so many times the symptoms were dismissed when they when it didn't meet this regular standard diagnosis. And so we re- realized at that point, we really had an advocate and someone who was willing to look outside of the box. And so it, after that first appointment, it was about three and a half, four months later that he reached out and said, I have found some research that says that people with autoimmune are actually having issues with the titanium. Are you willing to go back in and take it out It may not be that though. So it could be an unnecessary procedure. Now, please realize those are not my memories that I just shared with you. That's my husband's memory because I was so out of it. I wasn't aware of what was going on. And so at that point, because he had almost lost me previously on the table, that was a big decision. And he felt like he needed to bring my mom in making that decision. It wasn't one he wanted to make on his own. And so him and my mom decided the quality of my life was so low. I had young children. I wasn't interacting, you know, that three and a half years. I was insulated by how sick I was, but my family was traumatized and living in survival mode. And so the two of them together decided that the surgery was worth the risk. And coming out of that surgery, I immediately felt better. My brain worked better. I could remember my name. I could, I was aware of what was going on around me, but I still was at about 75 pounds. I still had massive chemical sensitivities. I couldn't eat any food. So in some ways I was so much better, but in other ways I was just better enough to realize what a train wreck I'd become. Wow. Wow. No, I think that's important. And I was hoping you were going to tell a little bit about that because a lot of folks will be like, okay, I get this out. And then like magically everything goes away. And, and and absolutely not. It didn't. In fact, for me, it got harder. The overwhelm, the absolute um, depression that not just, oh, I'm a little sad, but that really black hole depression kicked in because I realized the consequences of what my family had paid. I had been insulated for that three and a half years with how sick I had been. And so for me at that point, was that was the hardest point for me. It was at that point, it was easier for my family because there was now hope that something was going to change. But for me, that was when all of the weight and the consequences just hit and the responsibility of what I'd done and how much further I had to go. And where do I go now? What do I do now? Mm -hmm. Oh man. Oh man. So here we are fast forward. How many years now? Uh, Just over 20 years, just over 20 years ago. Wow. 
So in those 20 years, you've come now to create a website that has lots of resources, but also has products to help folks. And in particular, magnesium is kind of like your big thing. It, <laughs> it is my thing. I live it, eat it, breathe it, talk it, everything. It It's that puzzle piece that started building a strong foundation for me. It's that piece that when it was put into place, it's not that it cured everything. And I never want to come across to anyone who's out there listening, who's discouraged or frustrated, feels like they've tried everything. It, it doesn't cure everything, but it does put into place that foundational piece that's missing for so many of us to kickstart so many other processes in our bodies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was it one of the first things you tried or was it a lot of trial and error before you got there? So much trial and error. Um, looking back and financially, we had lost everything. My parents stepped in and saved us from losing our home because everything went to medical. Um, you know, we went from a middle income family that was in a good position financially. We didn't carry debt. Cars were paid for to absolutely spinning out financially because of the medical crisis. And so we tried so many things and literally chased so many symptoms. For a while, I'd work on my thyroid and then I would work on my gut and then I would work on my sleep issues and then I would work on my energy issues. And and it was really through that process that I created the philosophy of building a strong foundation and not chasing symptoms because chasing symptoms did not get me healthy. It was stopping, recognizing I needed to give my cells what they needed and I needed to start building at the cellular level. And that really is the foundation of living the good life naturally, which I still laugh because I never started out to create a business. It, it created itself. <laughs> It, it was one of those things that people started coming to me as they saw my health increasing, saying, hey, what about this? What about that? I've got a question. Oh, don't do this. Try this. Or this didn't help me at all, but this did help. And so eventually, at a certain point, my husband looked at me and said, okay, uh, this is a business and we need to start treating it as if because this is taking over our lives. And I realized for me personally that I was using that business to artificially boost my value because I had felt I was such a doer before I got sick. And many people probably can relate to that, that the doing becomes more important than actually being. And because I saw all this chaos that I created with my family, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, every, every aspect of their lives, I started doing to fill that black hole inside of me. Yeah. 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 No, I think, I think for a lot of folks, it, that is how it tends to, to play out. And then you go from one extreme to the other in, in the overwhelm state of, of, of chaos. It's kind of one chaos to the next. Yeah. Chaos. Well, and I had really bought into the fact that overwhelm was an emotion. And so I would cave to that emotion. Overwhelm is simply a lack of action. And so understanding that really helped me to walk away from the overwhelm, that when that overwhelm comes up, it's because I'm researching too much and I'm not taking action on the research that I've learned. Ooh, that's such a hot point right there. I meet a lot of people who all they do is research. And we have, have such incredibly smart, sick people. Yes, yes. To the point where, you know, some people will come into my office and I'm like, you have like a PhD and you know, you know more than me, honestly. And, and it's because, you know, obviously you've spent this time, but then there's this, this, okay, I know all this, but what, I don't know what to do with all of it, which becomes a problem because like you said, chasing symptoms, going one direction, the other going, going back and forth when really the foundation, of course, the gut big, but also your cells, like you were saying, and this is where the magnesium, I think probably worked its way in slowly through there. 
soaking in magnesium was a critical part for me. My gut was so unhealthy. I wasn't absorbing um, nutrients from food. I had been on a feeding on TPN, total perinatal nutrition. And so I was having a really hard time adjusting to being off of that. And so soaking in magnesium really benefited me because my gut was so compromised. And then as the process went on and I started understanding that little piece of synthetic oral magnesium that I always had been taking. I'd heard about magnesium for years and the role that it played. I had unrealistic expectations with it because it could not get me to cell saturation. And that's where magnesium really kicks in and starts activate, activating that vitamin D and opening up all of those processes. And so it became not only about magnesium, but about achieving cell saturation and literally no one can tell you how much magnesium you need because your burn rate is different than my burn rate. Mm -hmm. And understanding that burn rate has become my passion and helping women understand their own individual burn rate so that it doesn't matter if they see an advertisement that says you need this much magnesium every day, that they have their power, they're holding their power, they're holding their value and understanding I know my own burn rate that advertisement doesn't sway them. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So let's shed some light for the audience as to how do you discover your own magnesium burn rate? What do you do? How do you go about it? So one of the things that I recommend that people do is they need to get their red blood cell tested with magnesium. Mm -hmm. There are numerous tests. There's a blood serum test for magnesium. Most Western medicine, if you ask them for a magnesium test, that's what they'll run. But your body is so dependent upon magnesium for life that it will pull from everywhere in your body to keep your serum at 1%. And I don't want to know where my serum is at. I want to know how much magnesium does my pancreas have to help the insulin penetrate that cell? How much magnesium does my heart have? And so when you, wa when you want to understand magnesium at that level, you'll want to get your magnesium red blood cell test taken care of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Big, big advocate of that one for sure. Good, good. And so when folks get that and they see that it might be, you know, all, more often than not, I'll sometimes get it in the low end of the normal. And a lot of folks are like, oh, I'm normal. I don't need any. What would you say to that? How, how okay. do you approach that? Oh. I have my way, but okay. I, I want to hear Okay. What say. So let's talk normal. Yes. and expectations. So I've been testing and watching women, thousands of women test for the last 20 years. And it was about nine or 10 years ago, I'd have to look back at my journal for exact dates, nine or 10 years ago, give or take, that they actually dropped the standard for the magnesium red blood cell test. Now, here's how it goes in my mind. Just because society is willing to walk around sick does not mean that I'm dropping the standard for what my body needs for magnesium. And so I still hold myself to that old standard. And that is cell saturation is achieved at 6.3 or above. Anything underneath that is not cell saturation and you've got to increase your magnesium soaking so that you achieve that and not only achieve that you need to maintain that with your lifestyle choices now when you look at my husband and I he uses less magnesium and doesn't have to soak as often as I do even though his eating is not as spot-on as mine and we know sugar fast food those kinds of things decrease your magnesium and it's simply how he manages stress he is the Jedi master of managing stress. He truly lives by the philosophy of it's all going to work out. I'm working with him to get to Jedi master stage. Stress is what burns up my magnesium. I worry about those five beautiful grandbabies. I worry about my adult kids. I worry about this. I worry about that. Ah, oh, I didn't get this done. Those little hits of stress are what decrease 
my magnesium. And that's where it becomes so important for each person to understand their individual burn rate and what's decreasing your own. It might be lifestyle choices. It might be a lack of sleep. It might be a lack of mind-body connection. It might be medications that you're on that decrease magnesium. It might be sugar intake. It might be too many carbs. And so understanding where your weak spots are and where your strong spots spots are will help you put that puzzle piece together for how often you need to soak. No one can tell you that. For me to say, you need to soak three times a week. Absolutely disservice to someone's health because they need to determine that. And once you determine that and own that responsibility and become more accountable for your health, there's no advertising that can sway you because you know for yourself. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, I think a lot of people feel when they start to saturate, they can feel like I feel more energetic. I feel mm-hmm. more and and weight, I think is another thing. I, I don't want to turn this all into weight, you know, yeah. discussion, but I have found that the carbohydrates get processed better, especially when you're eating good carbohydrates, but you're, you know, not getting the benefits of getting that magnesium to pull the, the glucose into the cells and use it for energy. And typically when you're, when you're eating too many carbohydrates and the weight is up, the inflammation is also up. And if your inflammation is high, it's going to take you longer to achieve cell saturation. That's good to know. I think a lot of people don't have that connection. I think there's the connection of, okay, I put the, I put the magnesium in the tub, I soak in the tub and right. it magically, you know, starts to go up and my inflammation goes down. But yes, there, there is that factor. A huge factor. And I love to see people do a 30 day challenge. And then, and here's the step that I really want to focus on. Mm-hmm. If you are someone who is ready to create optimal health. And that is after that 30 day challenge and you've soaked every day for 30 days, missing a couple, if we're not demanding perfection, we just, you know, that 30 day challenge, you've hit 80% of that goal, get your blood work tested. So many people don't take that last step and is what happens is if you don't know that number and don't have that data for feedback, you'll either waste your time soaking in too much magnesium because you're at 7.1 and you're good, but you don't realize it, or you don't realize you've got a crack in your foundation and you haven't even hit a five and you're not fixing the crack. Magnesium shines the light on what is broken in the body in everything from a potassium deficiency to an omega imbalance. And we need to understand if your numbers are not moving how they're supposed to be, we wanna look and see what is magnesium shining the light on? Where do I need to course correct so that I am moving my numbers to that coveted cell saturation? Absolutely. Absolutely. How fast do you think? Have, have you, so in my, I've never done like a test my magnesium and then test it mm-hmm. a week later. How fast do you see that, that change come up when, and I know everyone's different, but I want to hear like in you just, just for, for your, your basic um, background, how fast did it, did it turn around from being in the lower range up to the six? How long did it take you to maintain? Let's put it that way to keep it up. Oh, to maintain. So it took me a good three months to really understand what was happening in my body, where I needed to course correct to keep my numbers where it needed to be. Now, the women that I work with, I see some of them doing that in 30 days. I see some of them that taking six months so many times people don't understand the time investment. And and this is where social media is actually making us sicker. We're so used to that dopamine hit and scrolling to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing that we 
don't want to settle down in and really understand magnesium and the role in our body, how it works and how it works in our body. And so sitting with that for a while, playing with it, determining how often do I need to soak? What does that look like for me? Do I need to soak in the morning? I've noticed that as people get to cell saturation, hold cell saturation, they can't soak at night anymore because they get so energized. And so as as that happens, they need to transition their soaking to happening in the morning so that they're utilizing that energy that their mitochondria is producing for them from that boost of magnesium. Ah, I think that's a key component because a lot of people think about Epsom salts and they think about, you know, ma you know, magnesium as a, a evening mm. relaxation right. type of, of thing. And so this is a whole nother spin on it where we would think, oh, okay, we need to switch that. Now you talk a lot about soaking. And of mm -hmm. course we have products that are transdermal as well with like right. the different lotions and, and oils and sprays. Will you shed a little light on the difference that you've seen between taking mm. a bath and using these topicals? Yeah, and I'd like to start with the Epsom salts that you talked yeah. about. Yeah. I love Epsom salts. And I think this is probably the number one question that I get on social media is, what's the difference between your magnesium and Epsom salts? Yes. Epsom salts are fantastic at helping muscle soreness, helping relax you. There is not enough magnesium in those Epsom salts to get you to cell saturation. And that's my objective with magnesium is cell saturation. And magnesium chloride that I use to achieve cell saturation does not have sulfates in it for your liver. So when I'm soaking in magnesium chloride, I'm adding some Epsom salts to give my liver that boost of sulfates, but I'm using each form of magnesium with realistic expectations. So I like to think of my sister and I, we look very similar, but we are completely different. I cannot take an engine apart and put it back together and get it working. She can. And so even though we're very similar and in the same family, we each have different functions and roles that we play. And that's how magnesium sulfate in Epsom salts really differs from magnesium chloride. Mm-hmm. Good, good point. Good point. Because yes, I use the terms interchangeably. And it's one of the things that yes, I probably need to switch it because if you go to a float center, you have mm. a very different type of magnesium folks than you do, than you, you're buying like the, the teals or whatever the doctor right. whatever one you get at, at. Oh, and don't we love those float centers? Oh, I love those. I, that's, I love a good float session. But so then let's go to the different types of magnesium. So a lot of people will start out with the spray. The spray can help hold you at cell saturation, but you cannot spray yourself to cell saturation. In 20 years of helping thousands of women, I've never seen anyone achieve cell saturation by just spraying. Now, I use the spray. I have it in my cars. I have it in um, by my, on my desk if my shoulders get tight. And it helps me to maintain cell saturation, but it cannot get me to cell saturation. The soaking is the way to get to cell saturation. And then we look, um, two products that we carry are the muscle cream and the lotion. The muscle cream holds more magnesium because of the molecular weight of the magnesium. The cream can hold more in the suspension, but the lotion holds less and is really good for babies, um, toddlers, and is really good for people who are really sensitive to magnesium and need to start very slowly. That muscle cream is really good post and pre-workout, but again, they won't get you to cell saturation. They help support you once you're there. And so using each of those products with the intended purpose in mind is really important in achieving cell saturation. Very fascinating. I did not know that. I'm learning some things today for sure. And especially with the, the lotions, because it's popular to use mm -hmm. the lotions. I have people using it behind the ear to help at night, you know, right. 
tight muscles, things of that nature. But I never used it in, in per se, in terms of, of, of reestablishing the balance mm -hmm. of the body. Now with the cells, it does make sense that it would, we, you know, we are creatures that are living in terms of, we, we have transdermal absorption back and forth. You guys, we can absorb more than just magnesium. But the idea here is we're, we're wanting to soak, but I, I imagine that there also comes a factor in terms of the water quality that we're using for these soaks, because I would imagine just straight tap water, just straight well water, something of that nature might not be ideal in this situation. What have you done or what have you found in terms of research in terms of finding the ideal water for a soak? So the last 20 years, this has been an area of focus for me. One of my goals, and please realize that this is my filter on everything, especially magnesium. I did not want to turn into one of those people that only focused on being healthy and lost every other area of her life. My focus and my desire for wanting optimal health and creating optimal health in my body is to run with those grandbabies on the beach and create rich, deep connections with my adult children. And so everything that I do, I look at the input and the output. I want minimum input for maximum output. And so the last 20 years I've focused, I've run data on all of the people who have soaked and we, for example, when we made that lotion, how much preservative we put in the lotion determined how much the skin could absorb because the preservative acted as a barrier. The types of oils that we used in the lotion, if you use certain oils, it slows down the absorption. Jojoba oil is a great oil that actually increased the absorption. And so everything that we do has been tweaked for maximum absorption. And I am a full fledged water snob. The water that I drink, the quality of the water that I drink is incredibly important to me. And so I just knew that water quality was making a difference when people were not able to get to cell saturation, because those are the people I really like working with and learning from. Okay, let's figure it out. Why aren't you getting to cell saturation, even though you've done the 30 day challenge, you're soaking three to four times a week. And in all of the testing that we did, did, we found that water quality did not make a difference. We did trans, we did, um, thermal imaging and we tried all sorts of different waters with tested people that soaked in only distilled water with tested people who have soaked in spring water with a large enough um, focus group to see did it change the percentage of how many people achieve cell saturation and we couldn't find anything. Wow. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So that tells us a lot about our body and its ability to keep out things that might interfere and, and allow for the absorption of what it needs. So <laughs> further shows you that we are kind of some pretty intelligent human beings here. Very um, much so because I, I just, I went into it with the bias of better water is going to help you achieve cell saturation. And maybe that's why this person in St. George, Utah, because they've got water softener and they're using all of that, it's not, they're not getting there, but we couldn't find anything that held the data for that. Wow. So I am a data geek and now I'm like, okay, so what were the top things that interfered with absorption and getting to the maximal level of, of magnesium, what like what interferes with saturation? Potassium deficiency. If they are not getting 47 to 5,400 milligrams of potassium every day, it slows them down. Uh, omega-3 imbalance. If their omega-6s and 9s are completely out of balance with their omega-3, that will slow them down also. Those are the two biggest factors. Taurine deficiency is another one that comes up a lot, enough that it's important enough to talk about. So a taurine deficiency, um, taurine helps you hold magnesium in the cell. And about the last three or four years, we're seeing every once in a while, and again, enough to warrant a conversation about it, a boron deficiency, because boron helps you hold magnesium in the cells also. And so those are the things that we need to look at if you're not 
hitting a minimum of a five after that 30 day challenge. If you're at a five, we know that you can progress and continue to move forward. If you don't hit a five after that 30 day challenge, even though it's not quote cell saturation yet, we know you're on the pathway. It's moving. There's basic functionality in the body. If you don't hit that five, we've got a crack in that foundation and we need to look at boron. We need to look at omegas. We need to look at potassium. We need to look at taurine. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Stuff. I no idea. No idea. Now, when you have folks testing for these, do you have a particular company that you're looking at for testing these or how, how do you go about it? I'm not affiliated with them at all. I love walk-in labs. Um, you can go online to walk-in labs pay for your test and then drive to the lab to have it drawn. And then they upload your numbers to your online um, portal. One of the things though, that you need to check for, I have a good friend who lives in South Dakota and her closest lab was six hours from her. I live in Morro Bay, California, and I have probably 20 labs within eight minutes of me. So before you pay for that test, do make sure there are a few places in the country that it's a, quite a drive to get to a lab if you're a little bit more remote. So make sure that there's a lab within driving distance for you. But I love walk-in labs. Uh, the quality of the test, there's some other labs um, that that I've used in the past. And you'd see people coming back, everyone would have the exact same number for six months. And then it would switch to a different number four months later. And it just walk in labs has been consistently for 20 years has been the most reliable testing that I've seen. Wow. Okay. So walkinlabs.com for mm -hmm. that. Okay, I'm gonna make sure I'm taking notes uh, as we go here. So it runs about $49 and you can almost always find a coupon code. I use a Chrome extension called Honey mm -hmm. and it just does a, a browser search and there's almost always a coupon code that you can get oh, 10, 15, 20% off that test. Oh, wow. And these are all together in, in a package that folks could find on there or you you put them individually into the I just do a magnesium red blood cell test when oh. um when you search for that in walk in oh. labs it runs about $49. Okay. I was thinking like testing the potassium and the oh. and all that. Potassium, I think, is a really tough one to be tested. Even the tightness of the tourniquet makes a difference in how your potassium levels are going to come back. And so on that one, I think the best way is just to track your potassium, track the nutrient. How much are you getting in, you know, good lentils, avocados? Are you getting those foods in that have 47 to 5,400 milligrams, depending on stress levels. If your stress levels are really high, we need to look at that higher number. And it's amazing to me, you get that potassium in and those magnesium numbers just move. They, they really go hand in hand together. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. I mean, these are things that were not taught even in naturopathic or functional medicine school on a repeat level. Maybe I've heard it and, and didn't hear, you know, solidify it, but I don't think so. So this is good. This is good for us. Now, in terms of checking the red blood cell, um, what was like with your data? Did you do once a week to check on and see where people were at? Did you do once a week too? What was the, we tried all sorts of different time scenarios. And again, that filter of minimum input, minimum cost, minimum time for someone to do. And we found 30 days to be okay. the best window of time to recheck your numbers. Okay. Good to know. 30 days, folks. I'm writing notes here, y'all. So you'll have all kinds of stuff for, for after this one, especially, you know, I'm a big biohacker and, and geek, you know, when it comes to all of these things. So, you know, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a 30 day challenge and I'm going <laughs> to have you back on. I'm going to have to do my before and after. And oh, I'd love to. And then, oh, I'd love it. So because your it. questions after are after you've soaked, after you've done the 30 day challenge, we can go down a whole nother rabbit hole together. I'd love to come back on and do that. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should just to give folks a really good, you know, sense of like, oh, this is how it works. Because I'll be honest right now, I, you know, as I was saying, when we first got on, I'm taking care of dad, different life 
kind of going on here with a little bit of different stressors. Right. So I'd be very curious as to, to how things play out and, and how it switches. You know, and we, we were talking earlier before we came on the podcast, that new role that you've taken on as a caretaker, and that can increase your magnesium burn rate. You've got, you know, you're, immediately your response was, I've got a great support network. Even with all of those things in place, that role has shifted. And so understanding what you're experiencing in life and the season of life that you're in. So menopause for me absolutely changed my magnesium burn rate. It increased it. I have to soak more now to maintain my magnesium than I did in perimenopause. And so understanding the season of life that you're in and applying it to your magnesium burn rate is a really important skill to develop. Oh, huge, huge. And definitely I'm in the perimenopause tail end of it kind of department. And so a lot of people who listen to this podcast are definitely in that. So that's a good thing for folks to know for sure. Now, as you were mentioning that, I was thinking to myself, okay, there's a couple of different things you've mentioned. Stress, of course, being one of the big burn rates. What about, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about my folks with multiple chemical sensitivities. I'm thinking about my folks, yes, like autoimmune, Hashimoto's, things of that nature, celiac too. Would that be a higher, have you seen a higher mag burn rate in any chronic illness as it would be my suspicion? Autoimmune. Autoimmune. If you have autoimmune, you just have to soak more often than someone who does not. Mm, okay. Um, another one is if you wake up in the morning and you're really stiff and sore and have a little bit of a hard time getting moving, which is all indicative of inflammation levels, a high C-reactive protein, it's going to take you longer to get to cell saturation. Um, if you drink alcohol regularly, it's going to take longer to get you to cell saturation. If you smoke, it's going to take longer. If you're a daily sugar person or eating carbs that turn to sugar, it's going to take you longer. And so uh, medications, another one, a lot of medications actually strip magnesium. And so it's so important. And that's why I'm so grateful to people like you that do all the work of a podcast and then allow me just to so easily hop on and talk. It's so important for people to have realistic expectations. If you're an autoimmune person who has high inflammation and is eating sugar and drinking soda, don't expect to be at cell saturation after 30 days. We've got to align our expectations or we're increasing the gap of frustration, which increases our magnesium burn rate. And so going in with realistic expectations is so important. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes, I mean, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense in terms of the different factors that are out of balance that are going to, you know, play in here as well. That's good to know. And definitely folks, I'll be noting all of these for you so that you can see them later when you read my podcast notes in terms of all the different things that can be out of alignment here. Now, I think one of the questions that I was thinking about before, and now it's coming back to the forefront of my mind, and, and a lot of people will ask me, okay, where, where does she get her magnesium? Where is it sourced? Mm. That kind of stuff. And I think that's a good place to talk in terms of sourcing. So every, Every time that we import magnesium, I want to get it somewhere different <laughs> because it is the most stressful process to take it through Chicago Port Authority. So we get our magnesium from the cleanest source currently available. My promise to my clients is living the good life naturally will always stay on top of sourcing because right now I could get it from Russia for so much cheaper, but it's very high in heavy metals. I could get it from Utah, not even have to pay importing fees, very high in heavy metals. I could have it sourced in a lab and the liquid suspension made from synthetic magnesium, but that doesn't move your red blood cell numbers. I can't tell you how many people say, oh, I'm soaking in a, in a liquid magnesium, but my numbers haven't changed at all. Well, what kind are you soaking in? Oh, this, it, it was a little bit cheaper. I saved $8. Actually, you didn't save $8. You wasted the time, money, and energy because a lab-made synthetic suspension of magnesium does not move red blood cell numbers. We have tested this for several years, and I finally said, I'm not putting another ounce of money, energy, time, or thought. It doesn't work. It doesn't move people's 
magnesium levels. And so our promise to people is that the magnesium will never be diluted. The way the FDA laws are written, they don't have to tell you that they've added more water because there's already sea brine. That's where the magnesium comes from is sea brine. And so our promise is it will always be at a minimum of a 31% elemental magnesium solution and that it will come from the clean a source possible, which right now is the Zextein mines. Okay. And where the heck are those? Um, they're <laughs> over in the Netherlands. So ah. we import it from the Netherlands and literally the week, uh, sometimes one to three weeks of importing, I need to just stand <laughs> in this little bubble and walk around completely immersed in magnesium. It's quite the process to get it imported and bring it through the ports and all of that learning curve, but it's worth it because it is the cleanest, it is the best, it is the most effective. And that's what gets families to sell saturation. And I have a belief that when you have a woman that wakes up feeling good, she goes from how do I get through this day to creating. And when she's creating, she invariably makes the world a better, softer place to be for those that she loves. And I'm passionate about being a part of that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean. I've seen the results of just using magnesium in our, in my office on on a really basic level. So mm -hmm. taking it to your level is a whole another. I mean, this is like way beyond anything. Well, and the cool thing about I think twenty. 2020 and 2021, one of the things that we've collectively learned as a people is how vital vitamin D numbers are in our body. We need to know our active and our stored vitamin D numbers because that's the gateway to our immune system. Those numbers don't drop unless you're low in magnesium first. And so it really goes back to let's start at the beginning, fix the problem where it started, and it started with a magnesium deficiency. Our grandparents didn't have to worry about that. They got it from their food. But now that red pepper that gave our grandparents their magnesium doesn't even show trace amounts of magnesium because of the overuse of synthetic fertilization. And that's where my husband's passion comes comes in a permaculture and restoring nutrients to the soil so that we're getting the nutrients from our food like we're supposed to be. But until we've got that chain of command put back into place, we're on plan B with magnesium and we've got to go in, we've got to get the cell saturation and activate that vitamin D and get people feeling good. Yeah. It's kind of like, as I describe it to folks, it's like that baseline mineral that you need for your energy restoration, your vitality restoration, yeah. and just your mitochondria, your telomeres, so many things that magnesium is the gateway to open up the functionality for other pathways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh man, there are so many things we think we could talk about so that I have to do, I have to do a 30 day challenge. That's oh, awesome. I have to. So I'm, I'm putting myself in for that and we'll get that started. And I will, I will tell folks how that plays out and we'll do a repeat podcasting. I'd love to, and before I'd love to come on after the 30 day challenge. Excellent. We're doing it. Before we jump to it, one thing I didn't ask and it just came to my head again is the synthetic magnesium. How do people identify if it's synthetic? Um, it's tough. It's okay. really tough as a consumer because anything can be on that label and it's number one going to be incredibly inexpensive. And for example, um, our magnesium for 32 ounces is $39. Mm -hmm. And I import more magnesium and I import the most that you can to get the best price possible because one of our core values as a company is quality products at a price that families can afford. That's incredibly important to me. And so if you're looking at this low ball price, they're producing it in a lab and Yes, it's inexpensive, but I look at it as expensive because you're wasting a lot of time, money, and energy for a product that will never move your numbers. That's and and 
you can't even say anything better than that. I mean, quality, quality and sourcing. Yeah. You got to know where your stuff's coming from. And yeah. you guys now know Kristen. And so we all know now how, like what we need to be looking for in terms of sourcing and things of that nature. But obviously, since you're bringing in the best stuff, folks have to go to livingthegoodlifenaturally.com. Hey there, if you enjoyed now, this is there anywhere else Netflix, they can find you? I bet you'd love Instagram. to join us in our Facebook oh, group. Yeah. Find your health Instagram, group. Instagram, Instagram um, Twitter. Also talk Facebook. About um, I'm, my team keeps pushing me to TikTok, but life. I'm resisting so a little bit. <laughs> YouTube, not definitely I've got some things on YouTube being there. Healthy for life, is your channel also called house. Living the Good Life? Yeah. See you there. So everything yeah. all across yeah. the board. Yeah. yeah, all across the board. All right, folks. So there you have it. Everything is at Living the Good Life Naturally and livingthegoodlifenaturally.com. You've heard the scoop on magnesium. I my mind's blown. I know a lot of different things that I did not know before this podcast. Oh, excellent. So excellent. Kristen, I appreciate it. And hey, folks, stay tuned in 30 days or so. I'm going to have some answers for you as to how it went and we'll go from there. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you.